This conference will now be recorded. Good evening. I'd like to call the uh, regular meeting of the Monitor Public Utilities Commission to order for sort of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> To the United States of America, to the Republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, any, are there any announcements, um, Mr. Director, that need to be made in, in relation to the fact that this, uh, this hearing is being held? Remotely as well as I have you to do? No, sir. Um, the, the posting is sufficient. Thank you. Um, next order of business is the consent agenda. Any issues uh, that need to be removed from the consent agenda? I have none. I make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. Uh, I second that motion. All in favor of approving the consent agenda simplify by saying aye. 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 We'll stay in generics. Uh, next order of business is items removed from the consent agenda. There are none, so we'll move on to water and sewer discussion and possible action. Customer appeal. Uh, yeah, this is um, item four. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wurlitz are here, and um, we've got the information that the water division office has sent out. We'll give it over to Mr. Zamway and they. Thanks, sir. Okay, friend. Um, so, Mr. and Mrs. Brillips, am I saying that right? Brooks. Yes. Um, so, in October of 2020, they received um, a $591.75 water and sewer bill. Uh, that was significantly higher than their average bill. Uh, their following bill in January of 2021 was even higher at $826.39. Um, when we went out and read their meter for that January bill in December of 2020, um, we called to let them know that their reading was very high and that they um, there's likely an issue there, probably an internal plumbing issue. Um, at that point, the customer um, I guess got in contact with the plumber who discovered that they had a leaking toilet. Um, the toilet was fixed and the customer's um, consumption returned back to normal. Um, as of April 26th, their bill was uh, nine, their current balance was $916.43. Um, and I will add that the past several months, the customer uh, has been making a valiant effort to pay down this balance. Uh, they paid $200 in each February and March, and uh, January, February, and April, and $400 in March. In that, uh, $916 balance on April 26th. I checked today is actually down to $700. Anything else? Um, the, so the, the customers reached out to us to see if there's anything that the um, that the commission can do to, to help them with that high bill or to um, help them paying it down. Please. Okay. And uh, good evening. We've read your letter. Uh, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, anything to add uh, to to the issues of the renewables contained in your letter? Well, I'm not sure what months consumption was in the most. But uh, during the winter, I was advised by my neighbors to let the faucet in the kitchen because if it doesn't, one neighbor had three thousand dollars that he had to buy. Another neighbor woke up in the morning with no water. But was this in the winter once? Uh no, sir. The uh the reads were um in the period of Mid June to mid September, that was the first bill, and then the uh, second bill from mid September through mid December. Mm. Well, all I can say about it, it must have been a fair clip. Yeah, seriously. 
I will say that's not inconsistent with what you might see from a police there was a correspondence today, but I can't seem to locate it uh, in the inbox from Mr. Kim. Yeah, it's right to your right. That's okay. Thank you. Mr. Ronnie, anything? I am um, thankful that the, the problem was resolved, the leak in the toilet. The fact remains the water was used, the water was disposed of. Um, and if there's a, an opportunity to enter into a payment plan, a small payment plan, with no interest, I would be supportive of that to have that payment plan pay down the balance as long as there's no uh, outstanding balance other than what appears here. So I think this has been outlined. I would, I, would, I would support that. So, for clarification, so this document is just it's a draft. It's been just shared with the public utility commission, not with the customer. Mm -hmm. You might want to do full terms, or I can do that. I, I would be supportive of a payment plan, and I think there's been some indication of $75 a month, or, or a uh, minimum payment of $75 a month, and, uh, and that would, uh, it would also involve uh, no interest uh, for the late payments. That would be applied uh, in a manner to work down the balance. It would be uh, uh, active and subject to uh, if, if the payments are made at no additional um, balances there. So I can go through this if you like, Neil. Uh, minimum $75 a month, no interest, 12 months, outstanding balance, October 1, 2022, in January 1, 2021, divided the full amount is paid by May 31st, 2022. Remain current future water sewer bills. Uh, contact. Uh, you should contact the office to enter into the agreement within seven calendar days if this is what you'd like to do. And I'll leave it to um, office staff to work out the details with you if you'd like to do that. But the idea behind me of this is to be no, uh, no interest, no living fees. Well, sir, uh, to be quite frank, I was shocked when I saw the interest rate. Yeah. I can remember working for Connecticut Savings, and at one time we did have, uh, and this is back in the 60s, we did have interest rate of over 5.5%. Now the savings accounts in these banks are 0.01 and you sort to get used to see a 5%. I was shocked. So I would appreciate it. My wife did make the uh, contact with Cindy and the uh, water division. So I'll leave it to you. What did you make with Cindy? That's a good idea. So she, she said she made $200 a month. Uh, yeah, and I, I do see that in your account. So if, if you keep making those payments, you'll have to pay it off even sooner. Okay. I'll, I'll take uh, Mr. Reinbold's uh, statement in the record as a motion. I will second that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of, of adopting the motion signal by saying aye. 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 We'll stand unanimous. Thank, thank you very much. Again, we urge you to communicate with the staff of uh, the water department to um, get this resolved in accordance with, with the motion that was made on the record tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, next order of business is um, agenda item number five, discussion of possible action, possible appeal of the law. Um, so this was a customer um, that paid all bills from, they had moved to Vermont in May of 2014, and from May of 2014 to December 2019, they paid all the bills on time. Um, then beginning in December 2019, um, the customer was not receiving the change of address. They did not notify us in writing. Um, so eventually we did some investigative work and uh, we reached out to Mr. Wallet. He said that he is no longer in Vermont and would send a written change of address request to the owners to the division. He subsequently has. We have updated our customer information systems database, and then we have also filed, scanned and filed the correspondence on that. Um, in the interim, Mr. Wallach has paid all the back interest on his account, so he does have a zero balance at this time. Uh, this item is in front of the Public Utilities Commission because a formal request was made for the PUC to address this. Um, it has self-resolved, but we need to follow the process through. And so, quite frankly, our recommendation to the Public Utilities Commission is that no action needs to be taken on this item. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Wallach here this evening. Any, um, Mr. Reinbold, anything to add? I'm not inclined to make a motion. We're second. So no action, you could let record reflect no action be taken on agenda item number five. Um, moving on to uh, agenda item six, it was withdrawn. Um, my number goes all the way to the way to number eight. I think there is a number seven. Yeah. 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 Oh, hard copy. Yes. Without so, agenda item seven is um, the, doc the documents in the package for then item seven is the wastewater treatment sludge transportation and disposal agreement extension. Um, so, am I correct to say that that's not in our agenda? That would, so it's, I have revision two of the agenda. You know, and it's on my um, own. Yeah. yeah. Should Kathy send us a revised agenda? She did. She appears to have. She faxed it. It's dated April 30, 229. It is what it got sent to the clerk's office. I just, I can't find out because they didn't see a copy of the work. Okay, terrific. So um, the the revised agenda does have a does have a number seven discussion of possible action smooth wastewater treatment sludge transportation and disposal agreement extension. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Henshaw. Well, and I will turn this over to Mr. Denway and Naples. Um, I think Neil's memo. Uh, April 28th is, uh, is very detailed, yet a fairly easy read, and does a good job of describing the situation. And then he provided a copy of the uh, civil drug agreement. So, to give you some background, so five years ago when I started, this was one of the first tasks that was assigned was to look at the wastewater treatment sludge transportation and disposal agreement. And at that time, uh, we did a thorough analysis as to where a Wallingford wastewater treatment plant, plant can dispose of its sludge. Uh, we basically have three options. One is to incinero. The second is Veolia at the plant in Naugatuck. And the third is the Metropolitan District. Uh, 
Connecticut working backwards. The MDC uh, cannot guarantee us that a five-year contract. Their main customers themselves, but they have their own four wastewater treatment plant. So that is where they incinerate their sludge and turn it into electricity. There is Veolia in Naugatuck. Um, they are a backup customer, but uh, we found them a bit inconsistent with their ability to take sludge at a high. Um, the strongest selling point, for lack of a better phrase, is with Cinegro, is they have backup facilities with both transportation as well as disposal. So if something happens with their transportation, they will continue to move it off site. And even more importantly, something happens with the incinerator in Waterbury, they have alternative sources as to where they can either dispose of it or incinerate it. So it's a built-in insurance. So um, we are looking at a five-year extension that would begin January 1, 2022, and then continue to December 31st, 2026. Okay. Um, the current cost or the proposed cost effective January 1, 2022 would be 104.08 per wet ton. And Mr. Bernie set some questions this afternoon and I can go through those if you'd like right now. And I'll just read them for the record. Hypothetically, if the contract was for a term of six years and you love and you utilize the current agreements methodology to adjust the current price to the 2022 price, what would be the what would be what would 2022 price be, aka the hypothetical 2022 price? Well, the 2022 price would be based off the Boston Brockton National of January 1, 2022 the CPI, Consumer Price Index. I don't have that number right now. So, what I did is I did a 10 year look back in the average uh, inflation for on the January's was 4.68% per year. So if I move that forward, the 2022 hypothetical price would be 100.88 per wet ton. Assuming, so moving on to question two, assuming the 104.08, the actual 2022 price wet ton is above the hypothetical price, what is the percentage increase from the hypothetical 2022 price to the actual 2022 price? So backing up, I will compare the 2021 actual to the 2022 actual, and it is an 8.00% increase. If I if I compare the 2021 actual to the 2022 hypothetical, the increase is 3.17%. So the actual over the hypothetical is plus 3.17%. The, the natural outflow from that question is, do you, do you think that that's a reasonable increase? And if so, why? Correct. And I think so. But let's so let's jump into your question three, and then we can kind of back up to that a little okay, bit. Sure. So footnote number one mentions Torrington bid prices. I will assume, I will ask you to elaborate on the similarities between Torrington and Wallingford and why the numbers in Torrington are compelling, or at least strongly pervasive to support the adoption of the extension. So. While we were finalizing um, proposed amendment number two, City of Torrington put out a bid, a three-year bid for their sludge uh, transportation disposal. Just for a point of record, Torrington is also uh, undergoing a tertiary phosphorus upgrade. Coincidentally, their contractor is CH Nickerson as well. They're about nine to twelve months ahead. They have an activated sludge treatment process, and they have a screw press. So. They dewater their sludge probably 22, 25%. We hit around 18 to 20%. So theirs is a little more cake. So theirs is a little more firmer. But Torrington went out on the open market. They bid a three year contract. They had two bidders, Veolia out of Naugatuck and Cinebro um, out of the water area. And you can see the bid prices were 127.07. So that's a three-year firm contract. So the same price stays the same for all three years. So what I did was I also projected our, if I take our actual price of 104.08, use the 4.8% projected forward to the midterm of theirs. So year two, it would 
while the first price would be 108.95 in the Still less than Torrington's bid price. My concern is, is one, we would have to go out to the open market, and I think prices would come at least 10%, if not up to 15% higher than what we're increasing. That's a risk. There's only really going to be two bidders out there. You know the market. The market itself is constraining itself. We have only two bidders. It's not a lot of options, especially in Western Connecticut. And I do look at the transportation of it. Warrington is right up Route 8, north from both Waterbury and Naugatuck. To get over to Waterbury for us, it's 91, 691, 84, then Route 8 South for the back roads. So to answer your questions, 8% increase. It is an increase. When we started this with Synergra, we were, we were in house looking at 10 to 20, possibly up to 50. So when they came back with eight, quite frankly, we said that we'll take it. The market's constrained. And in some respects, with Synergra, I would say a portion of the price is basically insurance. If you stop moving your slug off site, what are you going to do? Our price also, and this is a really granular detail, includes the dumpsters. Torrington is purchasing and or renting their dumpsters for additional money above and beyond this transportation. So the pricing is, is there. Um, and just because we are budgeting, the, just as another point of reference, the fiscal year 21-22 sewer division budget um, we included the additional sludge that we're going to generate from the tertiary phosphorus, and we also carried a 10%. Okay. We didn't have this number when we were doing our budget, so we're comfortable that our 2022 budget is a big number. So that's good. Did that answer your question? It sure did. Okay, thank you. Going out to the open market and go, you know, at night, cut the other ways. Yeah. Understood. Um, and procedurally, I will ask you to question number four. Procedurally, I will ask you to confirm that the ability for the PUC to approve the five-year extension was contemplated by and is permissible by the December 13, 2016 bid waiver. I like this question because I actually asked this question already to the Department of Law and Janice Small. Because I had this same concern. I wanted to make sure, and her so her her short answer is that when I double checked this morning was yes, procedurally we can. The bid waiver. That was um, passed by endorsed by the Public Utilities Commission and then passed by the Town Council in 2016, allowed us to enter into the agreement. The agreement itself is composed of the original five year plus the five year extension. But I know I had that same question. So, so with that, um, the recommendation from the sewer division is to move forward uh, with the sludge disposal and transportation agreement with Senegal and Northeast. They have to answer any more questions. Mr. Rimmel. I am uh, in agreement with comments. I think this is a protective agreement, Texas with both disposal and transportation. Uh, the cost is reasonable. Um, and uh, uh, it's been reviewed by law consistent with uh, agreement number Amendment number one. So I would be prepared to make a motion to uh, authorize uh, the wastewater treatment sludge transportation disposal agreement extension. Are we are we uh, for point of clarification. Are we authorizing uh, director to enter into an execute to, to enter an agreement for the uh, amendment uh, central amendment number two including terms and conditions extending from January 1 22 to uh, December 31 26 so we'd be authorizing you Rick to sign the agreement okay. Except, uh, Acceptable. I'll, I'll second a motion discussion on the motion. Just I, I concur with Mr. Ryan Bull's comments. Thank you for the thorough memorandum, Mr. Amway. Thank you for uh, answering questions. I'm comfortable with the entry into the extension. 
Um, we have a motion made and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 What's going on in this motion? Thank you. On to uh, agenda item number eight, discussion and action, sewer budget amendment, manhole repair and lining maintenance collection system. And my question to uh, you through you, Mr. Hendershot, is are we going to talk about eight and nine as a single? Yeah. Okay. So uh, up on the agenda are matters eight and nine, but we will vote on them separately and uh, take it away. So I'll just, um, Mr. Reinbold asked the question as to why they're separate. And so the first motion that we'll be asking you to make and approve is to move the money from operating into retained earnings. And then it's a second procedural motion to move it back out of retained earnings into capital. You can't put a capital straight into operates. You can't go from operating straight into capital. So this really could have been eight and nine for eight A and eight B. So that is why there are there are two per the government general accepting accounting practices. That's how you have to do it. So so that's the logistics behind it. Let me tell you the rationale behind it. So since 2018, we've developed a manhole inspection form. So when the sewer collection staff is out doing their high pressure cleaning and their CCTV of the sewer lines, they also do a formal manhole inspection. We rank them, uh, take all notes, and we end up with a rank one through five. Um, we then prioritize the manholes, particularly looking at our sewer sheds with high infiltration. Um, for groundwater that is coming in through cracks or voids in the manhole. Subsequent to that, uh, we basically rebuilt our manhole rehabilitation spec over the winter, current at the same time we were building the budget. And what we realized is that the majority of the money, nearly most of the money, will be for a, a geo a geo column of wine. So basically, it's also called spin sealant. They go in and they line the entire manhole from invert to the manhole um, with basically a synthetic line. So it adds to a betterment of the manhole, and it also adds to the structural, increases the structural integrity of the manhole. Um, and in some, and it's nearly the same price as putting in a new manhole. You're just, you're avoiding the destruction of the traffic to pull out a manhole. So for, because of that, internally, we felt that this money was really more aligned towards a capital item than an operating item. So this is essentially housekeeping. Um, but to be honest, we would be doing this once the new budget starts because we included next year's money in operating as well. Then you also look at each year we put $250,000 towards our sanitary sewer line. That's a capital line mm -hmm. expense. So we said, why is one people? The apple and orange, why are they both apples? So this is the housekeeping, but that's really what it is. Most of the money will be for the geo, geo uh, polymer lining. That's a betterment, increases the structural integrity. That meets the definition of capital. Mr. Randall. Uh, I just would like to clarify. So we are pulling the $30,000 that you requested. It's coming from account 673 or Four six one zero zero six seven three. That's currently got nine hundred four zero six four six one thousand dollars. Is that correct? No, currently, right now, the current balance as of today is around thirty-two thousand dollars. Okay, so this is actually that's that's why I was getting confused. So, so the nine hundred four thousand what was originally budgeted. So you're down to the last thirty-two thousand. You're going to remove thirty out of it into retained earnings. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So I would, if uh, Mr. Akinshen, I will uh, make a motion to uh, move thirty thousand dollars from uh, account four six one zero zero six seven three maintenance collection system to TO two uh, returned retained earnings. Um, I second that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing on all of those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Let's stay unanimous. Um, I will extend the motion on agenda item number nine. Mr. Rangel, if you don't have any questions. I don't. And uh, uh, for this item, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 
we are uh, seeking to move the $30,000 now from retained earnings into the capital and help me with this. Uh, that would be 30, that would be retained earnings uh, into uh, it's four six three zero zero three four three. All right. So I'll make a motion to move thirty thousand dollars from retained earnings into collection systems and apartments. Four six three zero zero three four three. And I second that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 We'll stand unanimous. Um, Mr. Hendershot, as I'm looking at the uh, agenda, I don't see a public question and answer. It's down at the bottom. It's 7 to 7.50. Okay, great. It is now 7 o'clock. Um, I will open up a public Q and A. Any members of the public wish to ask any questions? Yes, please. You can identify yourself uh, for the record. Adelaide Kopfer, 35 Whistle Tree Lane. Um, I was, thank you for the chance to ask a question. Um, I was trying to understand the material from the workshop about the rate, um, the, the rate generation study, I think. I, I don't recall the exact title, I'm sorry. Um, that was held about a month back, I guess. Yes. And um, so, if I understand that correctly, the major change in in the rates for the next four or five years is supposed to be um, a small increase on the residential side and a, a basically flat or a small decrease on the other customer classes. Is that correct so far? Uh, I'm going to direct that question to uh, the minister Hendershaw, the Siri, understanding that it was framed, the question was framed in a particular way. I understand that the response may be different in terms of just the increase based on sort of the yeah. ROI, ROI approach. Tell, tell me, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that she's that, that. correct. Yes, yes, uh, you're, you are correct. <clears throat> okay, and I think if, if I understand correct, the main reasoning, I think there were two points. Number one, um, that the, the residential customer class cost the majority of costs, I think somewhere between 40 and 50%. I think I'm referring to ooh, page number 29. The, the chart with the four shape, uh, load shape diagrams. It might be a different page, but somewhere in that region. I'm, I apologize, I don't have my computer here. I'm trying to do it from memory. There, there was a page with four um, blue bar graphs with the load shape. Okay. And so it seems like the um, the class, the customer class of residential customers, is causing the the majority of cost for the demand, the peak demand charge. Correct. That was one of the reasons. So that is one of the reasons. Correct. And and the other reason, if I recall collect, correctly was that the peak hour has shifted from about two, one or two in the afternoon to six or seven, six, I think six hour 18 in the, after, in, in the late afternoon, early evening. Yes, that's what those, those charts showed. So I was wondering um, when the consultant was talking about these charts, were those, the way I understood it, because he mentioned um, ISO New England or, or the New England um, area um, for one. And he also mentioned the shifting backwards of the peak hour was mostly related to behind the meter solar. So my question is, was he actually talking about the Wallingford shape load or the New England shape load? To my understanding, there aren't that many behind the meter solar installations in Wallingford that would actually shift the peak low, peak hour that far um, later in the day. 
So I'm really just trying to understand, was he talking about the New England shape load, load shape or the Wallingford load shape? Yes, yes, the, the regional load shape, yes, because that's the data that he has. Okay, okay, so, so that was my assumption. But then just my question is really just, um, does that even apply for Wallingford? A, we don't have that many solar installations. Is our Wallingford peak hour this, is the same hour of the day? Yes. And B is is um, so are, are the assumptions for Wallingford the same as for New England? Our capacity costs are incurred based on the regional peak, so it's what Wallingford is doing at the region's peak hour. Okay. So so it would basically be the same um, load shape, no matter what is happening in Wallingford in, in, let's say, in real life? Well, because we don't have that. Absent yeah. a tremendous effort and expense on low data recorders placed at dozens, if not more, of customer locations within Wallingford, and then the statistical study to analyze all of that data um, mm -hmm. using regional surrogates is, is the best alternative and uh -huh. that's all we did okay I, I i was just wondering if if that is um the best way we can do it because I, my feeling is that wallingford is a little bit different from the rest of connecticut or even new england because we have this municipal um electric division and and our we have very little solar installations and you know th there are a few items that that just make us different so I, I was really just curious if if that is the best we can do but it seems mayhew is that something you can um chime in on uh, yeah thanks uh appreciate it. uh yes it's it's not the best that we can do it's the correct way of modeling it uh, uh, Brian, Brian was absolutely on target. Uh, Wallingford gets billed uh, for capacity and transmission based on what the load in Wallingford is during the hour of the regional peak demand. And it doesn't matter whether or not uh, you, have, you have solar behind your meter, it's what your residential customers are doing at six o'clock in the evening which is when the, the when the regional peak occurs doesn't even matter if your system peak is in the afternoon uh the it, it, if it, it, it you get billed on what you're doing in the evening you do benefit from that if wallingford has a has its system peak at a different time of day you're paying less uh for capacity and transmission so that's a good thing uh, but still, when you go to spread the costs of capacity and transmission across the customers on the basis of their contribution to incurring those costs, you have to look at what the what each customer is contributing to that uh, load during that peak hour. And and I would note that the load forecast that was used as part of the basis pieces for this cost of service study and rate development uh, indicates that wholesale power costs are projected to go down each of the next four years, largely because of decreasing capacity costs. Right. Scope so for any other questions? Uh, nope. I think that was it. If, if I may annotate what Mr. Henderson just said, it was hard to understand. I don't know for for recording issues or there, there were background noises or he broke up or something. So did you want me to repeat myself? That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, I apologize. It was really just hard to understand. Well, we're, we're, we're in a room here. We're all wearing masks, so that has something to do with it, I suspect. Um, the, um, I believe what I said was that the, the, 
the wholesale power supply forecast, or the, the forecast of wholesale power costs for the next several years, which is one of the sort of the building blocks of the cost of service study and the rate development, uh, projects declining capacity costs each of the next four years, which themselves and the size of those capacity decreases are so large as to actually near, actually flatten or drive negative. Uh, wholesale power supply cost changes over the next three to four years. And we see that in the, in the, we see that impact in the cost of service study and in the subsequent rates. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And that was all, all the questions I had tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any other questions from the public? Hearing none, we'll close the public Q and A and move on to agenda item number um, ten: discussion and action water budget amendment security camera server. Extremely mm -hmm. huge, Mr. Shaw. Oh yeah. Um, so this is a budget amendment in October 2020. Uh, the security camera server that is shared by both the electric division, the water division, and the sewer division catastrophic, catastrophically failed and legs up. Um, so the electric division went forward and procured a new server. The electric division paid 100% for that server. And at this time, the water uh, division needs to pay their fair share. It is 37.5% of the server cost. So we are requesting, so this was an unexpected failure and replacement. We did not budget for it. Um, so the water division is requesting a budget amendment of $3,500 to account 433-00397. And the funds will be made available for the corresponding increase in the appropriation from retained earnings, aka cash. With that, I'll answer any, uh, answer any questions you may have. Any questions, Mr. Randall? No. I'll just a motion on, on the agenda. I uh, yeah, move to uh, uh, move $3,500 retained earnings to communications equipment account 433 I'll second motion. Discussion on motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the motion signify by saying aye. 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 On to agenda item 11, special action, signatory authority regarding Connecticut Energy Assistance Program. Uh, yes, John, you have my memorandum dated April 27th of this year. It's an annual request seeking the commission's authorization for me to execute this uh, document so that the electric grid may participate in the Connecticut Energy Assistance Program. Um, also, if the commission wishes, you could authorize the director to sign subsequent ones so we wouldn't have to bring this back every year. Or you could choose not to, and we can bring it back every year. The choice is yours. Um, I'm okay with the annual renewal. Um, Mr. Reinbold, any questions, comments? I I second that motion. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Mr. Reinbold's motion, sit by saying aye. 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 Uh, agenda item number 12, uh, discussion of electric vision workshop proposed rates. I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, both the director of the electric division and the director of public utilities. And just a question that I had. This presentation that was attached to um, our materials as agenda item number 12, that's something new that we haven't seen before. That wasn't part of the package that we received um, when we had the workshop. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of the information may be the same, but the business specific material, the specific publication, if you will, is different. I thought it was very digestible and easy to read, very understandable. You hear that, Mayhew? <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I'll turn it over to you to um, take it as long or as short as you would like. Uh, uh, it's very digestible. I, 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 thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. I will um, um, end this off with Mr. Bukeri with this brief comment that um, he and his staff and Mr. Mayhew have done a lot of hard work to get to this point, and I think uh, Tony's um, and Mayhew are quite well prepared to um, sort of summarize, the, provide sort of a high-level summary, and, um, and then hit, hit the highlights of this, this particular material that we really want to touch on in this workshop. Yeah, I just have a brief introduction. Some of the stuff we've touched upon at our last meeting, um, but you know, we're we're here tonight for a workshop on the proposed revised rates for the next four years. Um, my Rick said Electric Division staff has worked very closely with our rate consultant Mayhew, CB from PL1 to develop the proposed rates. Um, the rates uh, were developed with two broad objectives in mind. Uh, one is to ensure that revenues are adequate to cover expenses over the long term. Um, and you know the overall rate of return within statutory guidelines is between five and eight percent. Um, to move rates, the, the other objective is to move rates of returns across all customer classes that are more uh, move to rates. I'm sorry, of return across all customer classes that are more equitable and reflective of industry norms. Um, one of the things that was performed is a, a historic uh, test year cost of service study um, using fiscal year 19 data to more accurately reflect pre-COVID conditions. Um, this met me methodology allocated costs to each rate class and compared actual revenues from each class to allocated costs to determine rates of return. Um, calculated rate of returns for individual customer classes varied significantly, mainly due to uh, two items. One was uh, different allocation factors used for capacity and transmission expenses, and the other was a shift in the time of day when capacity and transmission billing peak hour occurs. Um, we then conducted a pro forma test year cost of service study uh, utilizing forecast data to determine the impact of changes in rate design. And one of the things, uh, just to, to kind of highlight, and you can see it in the material uh, that was presented on it's item number 12-3. Um, but the proposed uh, the proposed rates, uh, you know, on an overall basis, you know, including all customer classes, you'll see um, in the dark blue where it says overall in fiscal year 22. Uh, shows slightly over a 2% decrease. Fiscal year 23 is a 2% decrease. 24 is nearly flat, and fiscal year 25 is uh, roughly a 2% increase, and that's overall. Um, and then what I want to just highlight is that for residential customers, um, in fiscal year 22, there's no change. Uh, it's, it's a minor increase in the rate, but it is offset by projected decline in purchase power costs that we covered earlier. Um, fiscal year 23 uh, appears, it shows a 1% decrease. There's no change in the rate over 22, but because, again, declining purchase power costs, it comes across as a 1% as a decrease. And then in fiscal year 24, there's a 2.4% rate increase, uh, and, and in fiscal year 25, a 3.1% rate increase. Um, so that's kind of a summary of, of you know what we're at. I, I do agree uh, with the comments. Mayhew did you know an outstanding job in uh, Kind of summarizing this in a, in, a, in a short, you know, document that kind of captures everything, um, you know, within 12 pages. It, it very, you know, very nicely reflects all the work that was done. Um, and again, I want to give credit to the folks in the office. Brian has done an outstanding job in supporting this effort, you know, with the transition over to the, the water and sewer divisions, also on his lap. He's done a tremendous amount of work on this. I'll open it up to questions now. Sure, I will. I'm sorry about the document. I think it uh, addresses the fact that Long Turret has continues to invest in the lowest energy electric rates in the state, and that not by coincidence, it's uh, by understanding uh, uh, revenue requirements, adequacy. Uh, like the fact that uh, we're looking at uh, 
uh, rights across uh, customer class is not equitable. And it has a lot of fact that uh, we've uh, considered some of the allocation factors in TV and the, uh, the regional usage, including where square and how solar uh, provides energy and where it stops and keeps coming at a uh, shift and delay uh, time of day. So uh, I think it's very good. Uh, and, and again, um, it just reinforces the notion that uh, we want to keep the rates low and power adequate, reliable. So I'm, I'm good with this and look forward uh, to setting a date uh, to hear from the public. Uh, so well said, Mr. Ranko. Thank you so much. Um, I just also want to just echo Mr. Naples. Thank you very much. I know you're doing triple duty here. <laughs> Yeoman's efforts are appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayhew, I was a skeptic regarding uh, the, the sort of ability to stop having the residential subsidize everyone else. Um, no, having everyone else sub subsidize the residential. Uh, we had a battle about that four years ago. It was an epic battle. Persuasively, you have convinced me that this is the right approach, an equitable approach, a fair approach. And, uh, and again, I appreciate uh, your ability to say that in, in as few as words as you did in this deck presentation. <laughs> I'm also looking forward to a public hearing to hear what the public has to say about Anything else? Mr. Bernie, you sort of stole some thunder um, that I was going to throw in some comments, and, and you said it very well. And again, I want to praise Mayhew slash PLM for the approach here. And I'm, I'm really glad we got a fresh look at this. And the idea of individual customer class rates of return is going to stick. That, that's an idea. I may steal that idea, idea of Mayhew and use it somewhere else someday. Who knows? But um, it's, it's like finding a good recipe that, that is somebody else's. You'll take it home and cook it for yourself. Um, I think that's a, this is a great idea. And, and, and as you said, it's very, very well done, very well described. No. I, 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 I'm, I'm very pleased with this product. How it says what. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else uh, regarding the workshop, I will I will close the workshop. And I uh, it's a point of order. Did we need to actually have a motion to go into a workshop, or is just identifying it on the on the agenda? Oh, I don't think we need it. Okay. So we're going to move on to uh, agenda item number 13, discussion action, set date for public hearing, proposed electric rates. Um, through you, Mr. Hendershot, Mr. Siri. Um, so just, you know, we'd like, the, the plan and goal is to have the rates effective uh, July 1. Um, in order to do that, uh, they have to be noticed. It needs to be a public notice in the paper for the entire an entire month, uh, a full month before that. Um, what I I propose, that if that is uh, acceptable uh, to the PUC, is to schedule the public hearing on the uh, next uh, regular uh, meeting, which is currently scheduled for May eighteenth, uh, twenty one. And then, uh, does that meet all statutory requirements in terms of that, uh, notice for the public hearing? That will allow us to, um, so if we schedule the public hearing on the 18th and we adopt the rates on the 18th, we will be able to notice by 5.30. That will give us the full month of June and rates will be effective July 1. Correct. Um, Mr. Hen uh, Mr. Rangel, I'll entertain a motion to set a date for the public hearing. I make a motion that we have a public hearing for proposed rates on May 18th. And I will second the motion and discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the public hearing date for the proposed next rates of the FSA 9. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, any correspondence or community reports? No, sir. 
Um, it's just a question about the sort of this dual public hearing in room 315 and the uh, utilization of GoToMeeting, whatever this platform is. Is that, that whole decision making process come about? I like it. So what we've done here this evening? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, this sort of happened, Tony, you correct me if I'm wrong, is that because Mayhew was unable to come here physically. And so we interpreted that as um, similar to the requirements of the governor's executive of a hybrid meeting. We, we might have stretched uh, the, the, the letter of that um, executive order a bit in that the way I understand is the way that's worded is if, if any of you um, didn't want to meet in person, we'd have to accommodate that. We chose to go to that format of meeting because Mayhew was unable to be here and we wanted him very much here as part of this part of the workshop. So um, that's how we ended up with this meeting format this evening. I like it. It seems like it may be a bit more work for a particular member of the staff. <laughs> but tonight went smooth. <laughs> but I really appreciated this. Okay. Anything else to turn Having an option motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 7.30. And I'll second it. If you all favor, it's not a good time. All right. Of course, it's a good time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.